All right, so welcome everyone. Welcome to the online students who are going to be watching this. So uh, we're going to talk about plate tectonics today. And the reason why is because plate tectonics affects the whole Earth, including the oceans. Okay, and you're going to see where eventually you're going to see how this all fits in, folds into like things like ocean chemistry, uh, folds into the shape of the ocean floor and bathymetry. We get bathymetry and like the topography of the ocean floor. So all these things are set, the different ecosystems, you know, it's all created ultimately by plate tectonics. So you have to have some kind of understanding, oh, plate tectonics, and I'm happy to see my lava lamp is it's actually starting to work. Okay, so why do you think I have brought a lava lamp today besides for the mood lighting? What's, what's that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I brought it because um, I always like to bring in the plate tectonics lecture because it, it's, it's convecting, right? So, and what's convecting in, in the Earth? There's a few things, actually. A lot of this. It's the, the mantle, right? The mantle. So, remember there's convection in the mantle, and I think the lava lamp is a pretty good idea, or pretty good, uh, shows it pretty well, is what I'm trying to say. So, you, you know, you can see the wax, and the, I don't actually know what it is, it's wax or oil or whatever it is. But, it, you know, you'll see it convecting, so you can see this plume coming up right in the center, and eventually it's going to sink down. And why does it sink down? Why does it go sinking down like that eventually? Currents. What's that? Yeah. yeah. Con convective currents is part of it. Another part of it is just that there's buoyancy differences, right? There's density differences that create buoyancy. That's maybe what makes it float or makes it sink, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so the same thing is going on in the mantle. The same thing's going on in the mantle. And it's going to make lithospheric plates either sink or float, right? And there's going to be this great churning of, of the mantle, turning over of the mantle happens every, about on average, maybe every 100 million years. Okay, the mantle is completely churning over. So I know it's strange to think of this, but eventually, someday, the ocean floor, you think about the Pacific, the bottom of the Pacific, bottom of the Atlantic, it's going to have sunk all the way down to the core mantle boundary, 3,000 kilometers. It's going to sink down there, and it's going to rest down there. Isn't that a crazy thing to think of? You know, think of the Atlantic Ocean, the ocean floor. It's going to sink down, hit the very bottom, the core mantle boundary, right? It's going to sit on top of the core. Why doesn't it sink into the core, you think? The core is liquid, right? Outer core is liquid. Why doesn't it just sink right into the core? That's part of it, maybe the heat of the core. But also, what's the core made of? Metal, and is, what's the density like of the metal versus the, the rocky mantle? Yeah, it's denser, right? So, so the core is much, much denser. So that's why, that, that's why the, the crust, the ocean crust and lithosphere, it's gonna sit right on top of the outer core. It's gonna sit on top of the outer core because it can't sink into the outer core because the outer core is too dense. So that's the same reason that the mantle doesn't sink into the outer core, right? Because, well, one's solid, one's liquid. Okay, so anyway, that's the first question, right? Isn't that the first question? Is Earth's mantle solid or liquid? Is, what, what do you think? Is Earth's, man, is Earth's mantle just um, a bunch of lava down there? Is it lava? Is the mantle all lava? No, not even close. It's not lava at all. It's all solid rock. Okay, so the convection that occurs down there is what we call solid state convection. Solid state convection. Okay. So I'm going to give you a little bit of history on plate tectonics theory today, and then next time, um, <coughs> next time uh, we'll we'll kind of go into more of the details of plate tectonics. Okay. So you know how. Everything's divided into the you know, surface of the Earth is divided into all these different plates. Okay, so these are different plates. Now, what do the plates consist of? They're the they actually consist of the lithosphere. Right? The lithosphere. Now, is the lithosphere? This was a, on your question set number four, lecture set number four. So, the lithosphere. What is it exactly? Upper mantle and crust. Yeah, the upper mantle and crust. The upper mantle and crust. So don't forget that it also includes it also includes the upper mantle as well. I noticed a lot of people kind of, kind of put the wrong thing on there, but, but it was just the crust, right? 
So it's the upper mantle of Christ. Yeah. Um, I'm just getting this for free. Okay. So just to do some review here, we have the, the crust, right, very, very thin, and it's on top of the lithosphere, right, the lithospheric mantle. I mean, the crust is part of the lithosphere as well. It's on top of this lithospheric mantle, okay? And below that is the asthenospheric mantle. And what is happening in the asthenospheric mantle? Convection, right? Remember that. We have convection happening. So number two, it's asking, what power is that convection? What's making the convection, what's making the convection in the mantle go? I mean, think about, I mean, just think about the lava lamp. What makes the what makes the lava lamp convect? The heat, right? Coming from the bottom. So where is it hotter? Is it hotter down here at the bottom on the lava lamp, or is it hotter up here at the surface? On the, it's hotter at the bottom, right? So do you all remember like the temperature profile when we were looking at the temperature profile of the mantle? It's like 5,000 degrees at the bottom of the mantle, right? At the core mantle boundary. It's like 5,000 degrees. And what is it at the surface? You know, here at the surface, it's, it's pretty nice, right? It's like 70 degrees. So, right, that's it's what's really hot, right? And at the bottom, and really cold on top, and that's what powers the convection, okay? So the mantle is convecting, it's solid state convection, but it's all happening because of trying to release heat, right? The Earth is trying to release its heat. It's like, um, it's almost like the Earth's cooling system. You can think of it that way. It's sort of like Earth's cooling system. It's plate tectonics. So Earth is just trying to release its heat because it's got, it's very, very hot in the center, right? It's, it's white hot. White hot. Now, um, what's the difference? Number three, saying, what's the difference between asthenosphere and lithosphere? Okay, do you remember that from the, from the uh, I think it was lecture assignment number four? Right, what's the difference between asthenosphere and lithosphere? Where the, That's a good question. Is, is the difference between asthenosphere and lithosphere, is it compositional? Is it based on like the lithosphere? Like for example, is the lithospheric mantle is the lithospheric mantle different, made of different stuff than the asthenospheric mantle? Yes. Try again. Yes, yes no. <laughs> yes, no. I wouldn't have necessarily expected you to know that, but it's, it is, it's, but it's, it's both the mantle, we call it the mantle for the same reason, the lithospheric mantle and the asthenospheric mantle. They're both mantle, they're both made of the exact same thing. The reason that we call it lithospheric versus asthenospheric is because there's a mechanical difference. Do you remember me saying that, trying to emphasize there's a mechanical difference between asthenospheric and lithospheric? So the lithospheric mantle it behaves more lithos, it behaves more like a rock or stone. So lithos is a Greek term for, for rock or stone. Okay, asthenos means no strength. Asthenos means no strength. So Asthenospheric mantle is the part of the mantle that behaves more maybe like silly footy. Why is that? If they're the same, made of the same material, why is that? Because, the because they're made at, they're at different pressure temperature conditions. That's a very good question. Yeah. Pressure temperature conditions. Can I write that the asthenosphere convects in the lithosphere? Yeah, the asthenosphere, you could mention that it convects. The lithosphere does not, but you can also mention that you know there's a mechanical difference between the two. Okay, lithosphere breaks and cracks and crumbles like a cookie, and the asthenospheric butter, uh, asthenospheric mantle is more like maybe like warm butter. That's the way I kind of think of it. You know, warm butter, not quite melted yet. It's, it's soft, but it still holds its shape. It's still solid. But it hasn't it hasn't quite melted yet. So most of the asthenospheric mantle is close to the melting point, but it's not quite there. So it's absolutely a solid, but it is able to move and convect and flow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
Okay, so there's the asthenosphere, the lithosphere. This is showing the temperature of the Earth, the black line, versus the melting temperature of the Earth. And you can see that it gets very, very close to it in the asthenosphere, but it never quite, never quite cut, never quite goes over the line, right? Maybe sometimes it's even on the line, but it never quite goes over it. Okay. So that's kind of reason it's, it behaves the way it does, which is a really weird way to behave if you're a rock, right? You don't think of rocks as bending and folding and molding and all these things. Okay. All right, now another thing I wanted to introduce to you here is very important. And um, I don't know if I actually have this on this one. This kind of shows up more on the next, I think. But um, I wanted to kind of introduce this to you because it comes up a lot. If you look at the age of the seafloor, you get the youngest rocks kind of actually in the center, in the center of the oceans. Do you see that? So you get the youngest rocks actually in the center. Some of these rocks are totally baby rocks. Like they are, they're literally like zero years old. So they're newborn baby rocks, just born that day. And some of them, when you get get further out, they get to up to, do you see what, so you see how old the blue stuff is? About 180 million years old. Okay, so that's the very oldest it gets, about 180. <clears throat> All right, so we'll talk more about this next time. There's subduction, we'll talk about subduction zones and, and spreading centers and all that stuff, but I mostly wanted to kind of focus on uh, it's just showing how rocks bend. You know. Has anyone ever seen stuff like this? You can actually see some of this on, along I-10 in Texas. Um, you see, like, you might see a road cut, and you'll see these, like, big folds in the rocks and things like that, right? It just shows you that the earth is, can be very soft and fold and, and instead of just breaking and crumbling, right? So it kind of shows you how the asthenosphere can do that, too. Okay? So anyway, we'll get into all this stuff. Um, I like to show this sign, too, right? A lot of what's happening with mantle convection and plate tectonics, it's recycling of the crust. It's recycling of the lithosphere. So... You know, it comes up, it goes down, and the cycle starts all over again, okay? So that's what's happening to the ocean crust. But the continental crust does not sink down into the mantle of the, mantle of the atmosphere. We'll learn a little bit more about that um, next time. But anyway, for today, like I said, we're mostly going to be spending today looking at the history of plate tectonics and where that came from, okay? So this little charmer here is, um, this is a, early mammal called Sinanathus. And Sino means canine, Nathus means jaw. So it's referring to the jawbone of this particular animal, kind of dog-like, right? So um, what's kind of interesting about this guy is that we find fossils of Sinonathus in Africa, Antarctica, and South America. Right, so Africa, Antarctica, and South America. Well, first of all, does this look like a guy that maybe lives in Antarctica with the penguins? Right, so that's kind of first a clue that's a little bit strange. Why, why would we have fossils of him in Antarctica, you know? Um, also, does he look like something that could maybe swim across, doggy paddle across the Atlantic? It doesn't look that way either, right? So, so it's a little bit strange that we have fossils of this, this character on all three of these. Uh, continents, right? So this is kind of pointing to some of the early evidence that people were discovering in the 20th century that was pointing to movement of the continents. Now you have to kind of place yourself back then. Now maybe, have you all heard of plate tectonics theory? Has everybody heard? Pangea. Yeah, like Pangea and stuff like that, right? I'm sure, I'm sure like almost everybody's heard of this. But maybe you could like Close your eyes and place yourself back in 19, 1930s and 1940s, 1950s even, and people never, you know, never thought this before, right? Or never really thought this seriously before, that the continents would be moving. And if you think about it, doesn't it seem like the totally most outrageous thing that you could suggest is that continents actually move around, like mountains move around, mountain belts move around? Doesn't that seem like outrageous in a way? Doesn't it seem like if anything should stay still, like mountains should? I don't know. I think it's kind of it's kind of a crazy idea if you look at it from that perspective, right? We're used to it, but, but if you think about it, it's kind of a crazy idea. 
So um, people long ago noticed, right, in even the 16th century, wrote about and noticed that the coastlines of South America, especially in Africa, boy, they really look very similar, like they were torn apart. Right? So they fit together almost like a jigsaw. Okay? Now, that was kind of an interesting observation, but nobody really built on it until this gentleman came along. So maybe Alfred Wegener. You ever heard of Alfred Wegener? So he was actually a polar climatologist. He wasn't, he just did plate tectonics as a hobby. But, um, so Alfred Wegener was a 20th century scientist, and he was the first to kind of came up, came up with this idea of continental drift. We call it continental drift, not plate tectonics so much as continental. So he suggested, it was his first seminal works here was the origins of continents and oceans, and he suggested that all of the continents were together, okay? And this, this major, you can maybe call it a supercontinent, we he called it Pangaea, so that was his name. So I'm sure you've heard of Pangaea before, right? And he kind of showed, that he made this map showing what he thought Pangaea maybe looked like, okay? So, Alfred Beckner in this book, Origins of, Plate of, of the Continents and Oceans, had four arguments to support his theory of continental drift, okay? And these are the four. Now, it's, these are just words up here, right? Matching coastline geology, glaciation fossils. And you should write those down, but you should also understand what they mean, right? So for each of those, you should describe a little bit of what that, what that actually means. So yeah, I'm asking you, make sure you just, this one, make sure you get all the points on this thing. You know, make sure that you write a little description of what these, what these uh, four lines of evidence actually entail, okay? So Wegener came up with these four lines of arguments. So the first one here is matching coastlines. I think this makes sense kind of intuitively to everybody. Like I said, this is actually something that was noticed even in the 16th century, right? That it looks like coastlines really match up pretty well. Okay, so that so that's um, that thing's pretty intuitive for people to understand that. Now another thing though that maybe isn't so intuitively obvious is that if you look at very closely at the kind of rock units, the kind of rocks that exist along the coastlines, the mountain belts, the direction that the mountain belts are facing, the way that they're kind of striking over the land, uh, they actually match up pretty well. So you can find, for example, if you were to put South Africa and or South Africa, South America and Africa next to each other and, and you know line them up like they're supposed to be lined up, you would find that that there's actually uh, rock units that match up pretty well. You say you find the same kind of rocks in South America as in Africa, and they're of roughly the same age. Okay, so that was a big. To, to Albert Wegener, a big indicator that yes, these things were connected at some point. Also, you look at North America, Africa, you find the same rock units, you find the same kind of mountain belts that are there. You can actually find in New York, the Catskill Mountains, you can actually find the exact rock unit, the same as in Great Britain. It's called the old, I talk about it in my historical geology class, called the old, the old red sandstone. And it's, I mean, it's the exact same rock unit, right? But it's now it's right 2,000 miles away from each other. So, you know, just kind of, I know this doesn't really necessarily prove anything, but it's like Virginia and Scotland, right? The Scottish Highlands would have been connected at one time. And if you go into these places now, you know, just looking at the topography, it looks kind of similar, right? The mountain belts look kind of similar. If you look at specifically at the rocks, they look kind of similar. So, you know, the Appalachians, and the Caledonian Mountains in Scotland, the Scottish Highlands, look similar. Right? They're the same. They're actually, we actually we found out now they're the same age. And they have much the same kind of rocks. Okay. So another uh, line of evidence comes from glaciation. Now we don't talk about glaciers in this class really too much at all, but um, maybe you can suffice to say, glaciers leave a lot of evidence behind after they've visited the area. So after an area has been glaciated, it's been covered with glaciers, it leaves a lot of evidence behind. 
One thing that it does is it scours and scratches the surface. Glaciers are actually, I know this sounds a little weird, but they're actually highly mobile. Glaciers flow, they flow over the surface. Just like the mantle is solid, it flows. Glaciers also are solid, but they flow. And they scour the surface, they scrape the surface, and they leave these sort of, maybe you can call them directional indicators, okay? Little hints at what direction the glaciers were moving in. Well, guess what? If you put all the continents together, like their coastlines would suggest they were together at one point, you'd find that a lot of these directional indicators on the different, the different continents, the directional indicators that are coming from the glaciers, left behind by the glaciers, they all match up, right? So they're all in line. So that was another line of evidence that uh, Alfred Wegener was looking at. And yet another thing, think about this. Would you expect, there's actually evidence of glaciers in India. Would you necessarily expect India, like, or you know, what is now like equatorial Africa? It's like dense jungle, right? Rainforest now. Do you expect that to, to have glaciers at any time? So probably not, right? So that kind of is an indication that maybe the climate has, you know, maybe well maybe the climate changed, but also maybe these continents were at different latitudes. Does that make sense to everybody? So, so there's some evidence from glaciation. Okay. Now, another thing, and I kind of introduced this already with Sinanathus, but there's a lot of fossil evidence. So Sinanathus, I already talked about. Um, there's this little guy. Now, um, I wish I kind of had a better picture of this that kind of showed the scale. This is Mesosaurus. It's a Mesozoic-aged freshwater aquatic lizard. Okay, so it was a freshwater aquatic reptile. And it was only about this big. Okay, so it wasn't, this wasn't like a huge dinosaur shaped thing. Okay, it was only about that big, the size of a shoebox. What's kind of interesting is that we find Mesosaurus in South America and in Africa. And it's just not the kind of thing that would probably make a transatlantic journey. Small to do that. It's, it was also a freshwater animal. It wasn't a marine reptile. And you know, I mean, you know how it is, right? I mean, usually if you think about fish, right? There's saltwater fish, there's freshwater fish. Usually they stay something. An animal stays in either freshwater or saltwater. Usually it doesn't go into both. But another thing that's kind of weird. Does anybody find it odd that? Mesosaurus was able to cross the Atlantic, but couldn't, for example, go further north in Africa or further north in South America, or couldn't make it, you know, further to the east or the west. Like they have a fairly limited range on their home continents, but for some reason was able to cross the Atlantic. So that seems a little bit weird. Do you, do you see my point there? So that was the point that Alfred Wegener was trying to explain. So what's kind of, I guess, tragic or ironic about Alfred Wegener's life is that this guy was roundly rejected from the scientific community during his lifetime. And what's, again, ironic about this is now he's seen as like the father of modern geology, right? But during his life, he never enjoyed any of that fame or fortune, right? He was, he was rejected because people just thought it was a crazy idea. Like they could say, okay, yes, yes, Mr. Wegener, we see your evidence. And it's good evidence, but how could this ever happen? What could make, what could possibly make continents and mountains move? Doesn't that seem like a weird idea? What could make a, I mean, think about it. What could possibly make, people didn't know about mantle convection. What could possibly make a continent move? All right? This seems weird. I find it strange. So he was roundly rejected. His hypothesis was rejected for 30 years, right? It was 30 years after his death before people were like, oh, he was right, maybe. But um, uh, he died in Greenland. Uh, you know, he was a polar, polar climatologist. He died in a field excursion to Greenland. Um, some people think that maybe he smoked too many pipes and he, and he contributed to his early demise, too. It is true that every picture, I've never found a picture of Alfred Wegener without a pipe in his mouth. So. Anyway. 
it's kind of exciting. I've been like reading more about him, but like his journal, his was lost in the ice in Greenland somewhere. And who knows where it is now? So it's like people go out looking for this journal, like this lost journal. Mm -hmm. What's that? I think it's not gonna be like what the real one. They think well, because they're thinking it's getting you know flash frozen in the ice, right? So it's kind of like you know you get woolly mammoths that are fourteen thousand years old; they're still nice and fresh, right? They get frozen, they get frozen quick enough. You know, we even have woolly. Some of you have seen this in my earth science class. We we even have woolly mammoth hair here at Del Mar College. Let's see, did, they, did, I, did I bring that to earth science? I didn't bring it. I usually just bring it to historical geology, so maybe I didn't. I guess I could bring it to oceanography, and the woolly mammoths have nothing to do with the oceans, but I could just bring it so you can touch it. You're like, oh, wow, this would be what it's like to pet a woolly mammoth. It's actually not very pleasant. Okay, so uh, what happened? Why did people like suddenly change their mind and be like, oh, uh, maybe he was right? And is he still alive now? He died 30 years ago. So what happened that changed their mind? So somebody should have told them. Uh, well, a lot of geophysical evidence arose after World War II that ended up confirming all of these hypotheses about plate tectonics. So um, a little bit about these. Uh, so this is number eight. Oh, I didn't say, OK. Um, what do you think of number seven? Why was Alfred Wegener's theory of continental drift rejected during his lifetime. It's because he couldn't, it's actually right here, he didn't have a mechanism. He could explain the evidence, he could show the evidence for it, but he couldn't explain how this could possibly occur. He didn't have, he didn't have a mechanism. Do you all see the problem there? He couldn't explain how this could happen. Because remember, they didn't know that there was continent. They had no idea at this time. They had no idea about mantle convection. They had no idea about mantle convection. Um, but they did know from seismic evidence that the mantle was solid. So they just like, no way it could happen, right? The continents aren't going to plow through solid rock. All right, so, um, so number eight is uh, this up here. Okay, so these are the three things I'm going to talk about. And you know, if you want to just copy that for number eight, that's fine. But I am going to kind of ask you more specific questions about it. Just a minute, because probably right now you're looking at this and you're like, I've never heard of any of this stuff. I'm just going to write this down, and that's fine. I can just write that down for right now, and I'll explain in a minute. Whoops, sorry. Ah. Do you notice there's a word that pops up here three times in each of these? Symmetry. Symmetry, right? So what people saw was that there's a lot of symmetry on either side. Well, number one, they saw that there's a ridge in the middle of the ocean that I pointed out earlier. And they saw that there's symmetry on either side of that ridge. So they're kind of, the oceans kind of looked as if they came from this central point, the central so I'll explain, I'll show you more in just a minute. So symmetry, symmetry, symmetry. That's what kind of ended up showing that Alfred Wegener was right. Symmetry in the ocean floor. So uh, the story of how plate tectonics came to be embraced by the scientific community starts with this gentleman. This is Harry Hess, very, very famous geologist, very famous oceanographer. And he started off his career as a naval captain uh, during World War II. And you could imagine that during World War II, people were very, very interested in sonar and figuring out how deep exactly the oceans are and what the ocean bottom looks like, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why do you think they were interested in things like that in World War II? Yeah, U-boats, right? There were a constant threat to Allied shipping across the Atlantic. Constant, constant threat was number one worry that uh, 
you know, I was I was reading over the summer. I was reading some like, you know, first person World War II accounts of like the soldiers, the Allied soldiers that went across, and that was like number one thing they were all concerned about: the U-boats sinking the transports going across, right? So people were very interested in depths of the oceans and sonar and mapping out the bottom of the ocean, right? So they want to know how deep everything is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so Harry Hess is working on these transports, you know, doing sonar and echo sounding. And uh, the way echo sounding works, and we're going to talk a lot about echo sounding in this class. We did a lot of echo sounding. But uh, you probably know a little bit about this. You maybe, has anyone ever been on a boat, like a fish finder or something like that? You might know that you can you can emit a sound wave, right? It comes from the ship. So it's like what I talked about last lecture, right? Multi-beam echo sounding. Okay, it emits a sound wave. It bounces off the bottom, and the time that it takes for the sound wave to travel tells you how deep the ocean is. Okay, so this was relatively new technology in World War II, and it it let people really measure with great precision the shape of the bottom of the ocean. And you might know with fish finders, you can get pretty good images of what the bottom of the, the bottom topography looks like, right? Bathymetry. So that's what happened, right? They, they were measuring the depths of the oceans, and they started to find something very, very strange. They found that when you compile all the data together, and all the bath, it was called bathymetric data. Bathymetry is how deep the ocean is. It's a measure of how deep the ocean is. Okay, that's what bathymetry means. You find that, okay, you're, let's say that you're going from New York to, to Europe. Uh, it starts off really shallow. Okay, that makes sense. Really, real shallow. And then it gets deep. Okay, that makes sense. Sure, it gets deep. And then, oh my gosh, in the middle of the ocean, there's like a big mountain. And it's like a it's like a two to three kilometer high mountain in the middle of the ocean. And that thing is called the Mid-Ocean Ridge, right? We'll talk lots about Mid-Ocean Ridges later. But that thing's called the Mid-Ocean Ridge. And it's, you could imagine how strange this was for people, right? Because there's this huge mountain in the middle of the ocean. It's two to three kilometers high. And it goes on. It actually extends 10,000 kilometers from end to end. There are these huge, huge, huge structures on the bottom of the ocean. And then it goes back, and what I hope you can see is it goes back into the deeps, and then you have the continental shelves again. So can you see the symmetry here? Can you see the symmetry in the shape of the ocean basin about the ridge? That's what I'm, that's what I'm pointing at. It's symmetrical. The shape, of the, the shape of the ocean, the shape of the Atlantic especially, is pretty symmetrical about the ridge. It's almost like a, you know, like a fold out, something like that, right? Um, so that's what really struck people. One of the really famous, we'll talk about this lady later from Ypsilanti, Michigan. I'm like, my gosh, she's from Ypsilanti because they used to live in Ypsilanti, Michigan. But uh, Marie Tharp, but she was really famous uh, oceanographer that actually compiled all this data together and showed these. She was the first to create some of these maps. So it's a really important lady in oceanography. That was in the 1950s. Okay, so um, that's so. What does that show? It shows that the oceans are kind of being created at this ridge, and they're spreading from the ridge. Okay, so the oceans are spreading out symmetrically from the ridge. You see what I mean? So they're being created at the ridge, and they're being built out symmetrically. Okay, so what does that show? It shows that the oceans are spreading. Okay, the oceans are. Does that make sense to everyone? Do you see what I'm saying here? Okay. So people were kind of like, huh, maybe the oceans are spreading out from this mid-ocean ridge. More evidence came. More evidence came from something kind of weird called magnetic anomalies. Magnetic anomalies. Okay, so did you get up to number nine and 10 now? Okay. So let me explain a little bit about magnetic anomalies. So you all know we have an outer core, and it creates a magnetic field, right? You all understand that, same page there now. We have an outer core, it creates a magnetic field. All right, now, from time to time, I know this is a weird thing, but from time to time, 
the poles will switch. North pole will go to south pole, south pole will go to north pole. It happens on every, on average, maybe every 700,000 years. Okay, just something that happens. And it's completely predicted by fluid dynamics in the, in the outer core. It's just the way that convection and rotation of that outer core iron fluid goes. It's, just, it's, it's predicted, it's understood. It's just something that will ha happen rather randomly at different intervals. Okay. So once in a while, the south pole will reverse with the north pole. We call that a magnetic pole reversal. A magnetic pole reversal. I don't ask about magnetic pole reversals, do I? No, but it's a good thing maybe to just write down and know. But once in a while, the poles will switch polarity. One north will be south, south will be north. It's called magnetic pole reversal. It happens from time to time. It's for maybe 700,000 years. Yeah. All right, now, you might know that there are some magnetic minerals in the crust. And these magnetic minerals, magnetite, for example, there's a lot of magnetite, it's just an iron oxide. You might know that it's, it's magnetic and it will act almost like a little compass. So magnetite in the ocean acts almost like a little compass. And what's really cool about magnetite is that it'll be, the little magnetic crystals will point to the north. I don't know if this is north, but let's just say this. It'll point to the north, but what happens if there's a reversal? It will switch, right? So what happens in the rocks of the ocean floor, you find that some of them are pointing this way. Some of the magnetite crystals are pointing this way. Some of them are pointing the other way. Does that make sense? It's a magnetic mineral. It's, it's just the direction that it points. It's magnetic because because it's a magnetic mineral, it has a little polarity to it. So the crystal itself has the polarity. It points either north or points south. Okay. So I know this might be kind of very new information for you, but just take it as you know, random. Okay. Well, what happens if we go over the whole ocean we look at the direction the magnetite is pointing. Is it pointing north to our current north, or is it pointing to the south? And we actually can do this. We have these things that look like proton torpedoes or something, but they're actually they're actually magnetometers. They drive them through, drag them behind boats, tow them behind boats, and they can actually remotely figure out what direction the magnetite is pointing, whether it's pointing north or south. Okay. And what you find is this. There's parts of the seafloor that are pointing the normal direction, and then they reverse. And then there's part of the seafloor that goes back to normal, and then it reverses. And then normal, and then reverse, and normal, and reverse. And guess what? It's exactly the same on the other side of the ridge. It's exactly the same. It's exactly symmetrical. So it shows you, it's, like, it's almost like a barcode, right? Doesn't that look like a barcode? The barcode on either side the pattern of normal polarity and reverse polarity of the magnetite grains on either side of the ocean, they exactly match each other Okay, on either side of the ridge. So what does that show? It shows that the ridge, the ocean floor, came out symmetrically from the ridge. So it's spreading symmetrically from this ridge and being created symmetrically from the ridge. So it shows that the oceans were being created from the ridge. So oceans were spreading. They started off small and they spread from the ridge. And as they spread from the ridge, they're pushing the continents apart. Okay, does that make sense? Does everybody follow that? Okay, so can you write a sentence explaining that does everybody feel comfortable with writing a sentence like explaining what a magnetic anomaly? So the magnetic anomaly is that reversal, right? The anomalous direction of the magnetite grains pointing to south instead of north, right? there was a reversal at some point in Earth history. Can every, is there a way, is anybody like, you can shake your head and say, I have no idea what I'm writing. <laughs> okay, so magnetic reversal. So magnetic anomaly is one of these magnetic reversals that occur from time to time. Magnetic anomaly is just one of these magnetic reversals that occur from time to time in Earth history, over Earth's history. 
we have a record of these magnetic reversals, these magnetic anomalies. We have a record of them preserved in the seafloor rocks by magnetic minerals. And we can look at, we can actually pick up and read and see what the uh, orientation of those magnetic minerals, we can actually see in the rocks, measure in the rocks, the, the orientation of those magnetic minerals and show if this was a period, when the rock was created, was it a period of normal polarity or was it a period of reverse polarity? So normal or reverse, normal or reverse. So what are magnetic anomalies? It's just a period of reverse polarity. The outer core is generating you know, the magnetic field and the poles reverse, north to south, south to north. And how are those magnetic anomalies preserved in the rock? Can anybody answer that now? Does anybody feel comfortable asking? How are those magnetic anomalies preserved in the rock? Goes back to this, right? How is it? How are they being preserved in the rock? Those magnetic anomalies. Magnetic reversal. Yeah. So the magnetite grains, the the magnetic minerals that are in the naturally found in the rock, preserve the orientation of that of the field at the time they were created. They preserved the orientation of the magnetic field when they were created because they, they're, they're magnetic. The minerals themselves are magnetic there in the rock. So they act like little compass needles. They point to north, whether the north is at the north pole or the south pole during a magnetic anomaly, during magnetic reversal. Okay, is this, how about now? Is, any, is anybody still confused? You can shake your head if you're still confused. All right, so how does that support the theory of plate tectonics? It shows the pattern, the pattern of magnetic reversals versus the, the pattern, maybe we could say, just say the pattern of magnetic anomalies is symmetrical on, e on either side of the ocean ridge, and it shows, therefore, that the oceans were spreading from the ridge. The oceans were spreading from the ridge. And that's how continents are being moved. They're being moved by seafloor spread. Right? And that's what Alfred Wegener was missing in, his, in his, his theory, right? He didn't have a mechanism. Well, the mechanism is seafloor spreading. That's what's pushing the continents, causing the continents to drift. So does that make sense? The pattern of what? What's that? What did you say? The pattern of I hear you. Sure. Let me. I'll just. I'll just keep saying. It. Okay. I'll keep saying. It. So. So. No, so how does this prove the theory of plate tectonics? Theory of continental drift. It proves it because the pattern of magnetic anomalies is the same. It's symmetrical. It's the same on either side of the ridge. See, so here's the ridge right here. Okay. Can you see on either side of the ridge? The pattern of magnetic anomalies is the same. That shows that the, the ocean was being built up and created, spreading symmetrically from the ridge. Therefore, seafloor spreading is happening. And that's what's pushing the continents apart, causing continental drift, plate tectonics, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that's, you should write something like that for, what is it, question number, right, question number 13. Okay, I know this is really hard. This is like the hardest, probably one of the, probably up to now, probably one of the hardest concepts in the class. So it's up there. It's probably in the top five hardest concepts in this class. So if you're struggling with it, it's okay. Okay, so are we ready to move on? Yeah? All right. You don't have to understand it perfectly. <laughs> 
but just magnetism, something, seafloor, plate tectonics. Okay, so anyway, um, the next thing is, okay, the next kind of nail in the coffin that proved that plate tectonics was a thing was when we finally developed radiometric dating. Okay, so radiometric dating is where you use radioactive isotopes to figure out how old a rock is. Okay? So radiometric dating provided further evidence for seafloor spreading continent. So how did they do that? Well, when we started taking radiometric ages of the rocks, what did we find? We found that, oh, sure enough, the rocks are youngest on the mid-ocean ridges, and they're oldest, they get progressively older as you move away from the ridge. So they start off young and they progressively get older as you move away from the ridge. Okay? So again, what does that show? It shows that the rocks, this is like much easier to understand, I think. It just shows that the rocks are being created at the ridge and they're spreading out from the ridge. And you're getting it directly now from the, from the ages. Okay, so does that all make sense? So do you all see how that supports plate tectonics theory? Because remember, what did Alfred Wegener lack? What was he missing from his theory? A mechanism, right? This is the mechanism, it's seafloor spreading. Okay, it's put, the seafloor is spreading, it's pushing the continents away from each other. So, you got number 14, I hope. Number 15, how do patterns in seafloor age support the theory of plate tectonics? It supports it because it shows that the youngest rocks are in the center, the oldest rocks on the outside. It shows that the, the plates, the seafloor is being, you know, progressively, uh, it's, it's spreading out, right? It's being created at the center and spreading out. And it's, that is what pushes the continents away. That's the mechanism that moves the continents, continental drift, and uh, drives plate tectonics, right? Okay, so this is kind of just the de depiction of how this all works, right? You start off with continent A and B practically touching but a mid-ocean ridge develops in the middle of them. And this actually starts with a process called continental rifting. Has anyone ever heard of a rift? A rift in the continents? So there's like, for example, there's a real famous one in East Africa. Has anyone ever heard of the East Africa rift? Okay, well, East Africa rift is it's a big deal, but um, that's kind of like where continents are ripping apart. So they start to rip apart. They develop actually an ocean in the middle of them. And as that ocean grows with time, it pushes the continents apart, okay? So that's ocean, sea, that's what's called seafloor spreading. So you can see seafloor spreading is the mechanism that Alfred Wegener was missing that pushes the continents away from each other, okay? So hopefully that kind of tells you uh, the answer number 16, okay? So does everybody feel good with 16? No, still? Okay, so seafloor spreading. What is seafloor spreading? It's just the idea that the seafloor starts off at the mid-ocean ridge and it gets progressively older and it spreads out over time, right? So it starts off very small, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as so it's created at the ridge. So ocean floor is constantly created at the ridge. And as it gets created, it pushes the continents apart from each other and that's that's the continental drift, right? That's what pushes continent A and B away from each other over time. Okay, so it seems like most people have gotten it, so I'll move on. I'm almost done here, as you can see. So I um, wanted to show you a little bit of this. So this, these are really, and this will become very important as we look, go through the class, is these are very volcanically active areas. Okay, right here on the mid-ocean ridges. So there's constant volcanism uh, occurring on, along these mid-ocean ridges. So this is this is kind of video.
scares me every semester. <laughs> You just said it. Did you all hear that? He was saying that 80%, 80, so this is actually pretty crazy that, you know, this, this ROV, remember we talked about ROVs, right? These remotely operated submersible vehicles. They, they just recently were able to get these to go to a mid-ocean ridge and actually view real time you see the video and this has just happened in the last like several years you know and this is the most common the place of the most common place volcanoes occur it creates 80 percent of the volcanoes that are happening are it's this right so the volcanoes that you see on tv that's only 20 percent of the volcanoes that are actually happening on earth vast majority are happening like this underwater at the mid-ocean ridges we just don't see it. So this is like the first time it was really caught on camera like that. And it's just happened in the last several years, you know. So, so that's what he was trying to impress upon his audience, that guy that was talking. Okay. So what's constantly created at mid-ocean ridges? Volcanoes and ocean crust, right? Ocean crust is constantly being created at the mid-ocean ridges. So it's constantly created, and then it pushes out and keeps pushing out, pushing away from the ridge, and spreading the seafloors, and spreading the continents, making them drift further away from each other. Okay. So does everybody understand this? Does this all make sense? I know magnetic anomalies are very hard to understand, but if you can at least get a superficial grasp on those, that's fine for the class. Okay. Um, Oh, number four, what is it? What drives seafloor spreading continental drift in all plate tectonics? Mantle convection. It's mantle convection here. So yeah, this thing, I gotta plug this in earlier, because then it doesn't, oh, it's just starting to go now. There's the first little piece, traveling up. Okay, whatever. But anyway, um, I just wanna, one, before you go, I just wanna say one last thing here. Um, okay, the seafloors are spreading. Right, the seafloors are spreading, but the Earth isn't like getting bigger, right? So there has to be a place where ocean crust. So we see where ocean crust is created. We have to see where it's destroyed. So next lecture we'll see the places that they're destroyed at. Okay, so that'll be kind of look at that. All right, so I will read ten little extra credit assignments for you, so you can play with that simulator, and uh, I'll do that Monday. And have a good weekend. And I will see you next time. Make sure to leave your assignment number five, history of marine science, on your desk there. And I will come collect it and have a good weekend. See you next time. Yes? Did we get three out of ten on this one? I did, there's no grade, but I didn't know if. But you gave me three out of ten on the things so I didn't know if there was like a reason or. <laughs> I have no idea why I did that. Because <laughs> like I, no I got the, the other thing worth the other day and I was like, yeah.